Welcome to Brainish English Stories. No one ever thought that May Forster would marry John Charrington. But he thought differently, and things which John Charrington wanted had a strange way. He asked her to marry him before he went up to Oxford. She laughed and refused him. He asked her again next time he came home. Again she <laughs> laughed, shook her delicate blonde head, and again refused. A third time he asked her, she said it was becoming a confirmed bad habit, and laughed at him more than ever. John was not the only man who wanted to marry her. She was the most beautiful girl of our village. And we were all in love with her more or less. It was a sort of fashion, like using her expensive perfume or wearing a coat. Therefore we were as much annoyed as surprised when John Charrington walked into our little local club. He came and invited us all to his wedding. Your wedding? You don't mean it? Who is the happy lady? When is it? John Charrington filled his pipe and lighted it before he replied. Then he said, I'm sorry to dishearten you, my dear fellows, but Miss Forster and I are to be married in September. You don't mean it? He is mad again. Hey John, are you sick? One of our friends said laughing. No, I said, rising. I see it's true. Charrington has bewitched the only pretty girl in our twenty-mile radius. Was it mesmerism or a love potion? No, none of this, my dear friends. But I had a gift called patience that you'll never have. And also the best luck a man ever had in this world. John said very proudly. There was something in his voice that silenced me, and all other friends. Then other fellows stopped mocking him. The strangest thing about it was that when we congratulated Miss Forster, she blushed and smiled and dimpled, for all the world as though she were in love with him, and had been in love with him all the time. Upon my word, I think she had. Women are strange creatures. We were all invited to the wedding. In Brixham if anyone knew anyone then they were all invited. My sisters were, I truly believe, more interested in the dowry than the bride herself. The coming marriage was much canvassed at afternoon tea tables and at our little club. But the question was always asked, does she care for him? I used to ask that question myself in the early days of their engagement, but after a certain evening in August I never asked it again. I was coming home from the club through the churchyard. Our church is on a time-grown hill, and the grass on it is so thick and soft that one's footsteps are noiseless. I made no sound as I jumped over the low lichen wall and crossed my way between the tombstones. It was at the same instant that I heard John Charrington's voice and saw her. May was sitting on a low flat gravestone, her face turned towards the bright sun. The expression on John's face and May's face ended my doubt and any question of love for him. They both were madly in love with each other and looked into each other's eyes with full passion. Then I heard John saying, my dear, my dear, I believe I should come back from the dead if you wanted me. I coughed at once to indicate my presence and passed on the graveyard back to home. The wedding was to be early in September. Two days before the wedding, I had to go to the town for business. The train was late, of course, for we are on the southeastern. I stood complaining looking at my watch. Then I saw John Charrington and May Forster at the station. They were walking up and down the platform. 
they held each other's hands and looking into each other's eyes. They didn't even notice the porters who were interested on carrying their bags. The train arrived late and passed the couple with my suitcase and took the corner in a first-class smoking carriage. John was traveling alone and I wanted his company. I had it. Hello, Jeffrey, came his cheery voice as he swung his bag into my carriage. This is called luck. I was expecting a dull journey but you are here to accompany me, said John. Where are you off to? I asked. To my old godfather Mr. Branbridge, he answered, shutting the door and leaning out for a last word with his sweetheart. Oh, I wish you wouldn't go, John, she was saying in a low, earnest voice. I feel certain something bad will happen, said May sadly. Do you think I should let anything happen to keep me, and the day after tomorrow our wedding day? said John to her. Don't go, she answered, pleading him in such a way that even I would have left all my work and agreed to stay with her. But she wasn't speaking to me. John Charrington was made differently, he rarely changed his opinions and never his promises. He didn't say anything but patted her little ungloved hands that lay on the carriage door. Then suddenly John said, I must, may. The old man has been very good to me, and now he's dying I must go and see him, but I shall come home in time for our wedding. The rest of the parting was lost in a whisper and in the rattling lurch of the starting train. You're sure to come, she spoke as the train moved. Nothing shall keep me, he answered and we steamed out. He leaned back in his corner and kept silence for a minute. Then he explained to me that his godfather, whose heir he was, lay dying at Peasmarsh Place, some fifty miles away, and had called for John to stay near him in his last days. I shall be surely back tomorrow, or, if not, the day after. He said, and suppose Mr. Branbridge dies? I asked. Alive or dead I mean to be married on Thursday. John answered, lighting a cigar and unfolding a newspaper. At Peasmarsh Station we said, goodbye, and he got out, and I saw him ride off, I went on to London, where I stayed the night. When I got home the next afternoon, a very wet one, by the way, my sister greeted me with. Where's Mr. Charrington? Goodness knows, I answered quickly. I thought you might have heard from him, she said. Isn't he back? I asked, because I expected to find him at home. No, Geoffrey, he has not returned, and I think he won't. You mark my words, there'll be no wedding tomorrow, said my sister Fanny very sharply. My sister Fanny has a power of annoying me which no other human being possesses. You mark my words, there'll be more weddings tomorrow than you ever thought. Stop making such stupid predictions. I replied her quickly and angrily. But though I didn't believe in my sister's words, I did not feel so comfortable when, late that night, I, standing on the doorstep of John's house, heard that he had not returned. I went home very unhappy, through the rain. Next morning brought a brilliant blue sky and gold sun to make that day perfect. Then a note came from John which relieved my mind and sent me to the May Forster's house. May was in the garden. I saw her blue gown coming out of the gate. So I did not go up to the house, but turned aside down the grass path. He has written to you too, she said. 
Yes, I'm to meet him at the station at three, and come straight on to the church. I replied. Her face looked pale, but there was a brightness in her eyes. Mr. Branbridge begged him so to stay another night that he had not the heart to refuse, she went on. He is so kind, but I wish he hadn't stayed. I was at the station at half past two. I felt rather annoyed with John. It seemed unfair to the beautiful girl who loved him. He should have come to hold her hand and go to the church for their wedding. But when the three o'clock train glided in, and glided out again having brought no passengers to our little station, I was more than annoyed. There was no other train for thirty-five minutes, I calculated that, with much hurry, we might just get to the church in time for the ceremony. But, oh, what a fool he is to miss that first train. Why is he doing it on his wedding day? That thirty-five minutes seemed a year, and I was getting more and more angry with John Charrington. I hated waiting. Everyone does, but I believe I hate it more than anyone else. I ground my pipe between my teeth, and stood with impatience as I watched the signals. Click. The signal went down. Five minutes later, I flung myself into the carriage that I had brought for John. Drive to the church. I said, as someone shut the door. Mr. Charrington hasn't come by this train. Anxiety now replaced anger. What had become of the man? Could he have been taken suddenly ill? I had never known him have a day's illness in his life. And even so he might have telegraphed. Some awful accident must have happened to him. Yes, something terrible had happened to him, and on me lay the task of telling his bride. I almost wished the carriage would upset and break my head so that someone else might tell her, not I. It was five minutes to four as we drew up at the churchyard gate. I sprang from the carriage and went inside. Our gardener Biles had a good front place near the door. I stopped. Are they waiting still, Biles? I asked. Waiting, sir? No, no, sir. Why, the ceremony must be over by now. Over. Then has Mr. Charrington arrived? He arrived at the last minute, sir. He said lowering his voice, I never seen Mr. John like this before, but my opinion, he has been drinking very much. His clothes were all dusty. I tell you I didn't like the looks of him at all, and the people inside are saying all sorts of things. You'll see, something's gone very wrong with Mr. John. He looked like a ghost. I had never heard Biles making such a long speech. The crowd in the churchyard were talking in whispers and getting ready to throw flowers at the bride and bridegroom. The ringers were ready with their hands on the ropes to ring out the merry song as the bride and bridegroom should come out. A murmur from the church announced them, out they came. Biles was right. John Charrington did not look himself. There was dust on his coat, his hair was tangled. He was deathly pale. But the bride was also pale as ivory. As they passed out the ring as stooped, there were six of them, and then, the ears were expecting the happy wedding ringing, but the sound of funeral bells came. A thrill of horror passed through us all. But the ringers themselves dropped the ropes and ran away. The bride was shivering with terror, but the bridegroom led her down through the path. 
the deadly bridal couple sat into the carriage and went to May's father's house for reception. Mr. Forster and I followed their carriage. Drive fast, Mr. Forster said to the coachman. We passed the bride's carriage. We reached home before it. We stood in the hall doorway, in the blazing afternoon sun, and in about half a minute we heard carriage arriving. When the carriage stopped in front of the steps, old Forster and I ran down. Great heaven, the carriage is empty. And yet, I had the door open in a minute, and this is what I saw. No sign of John Charrington. And May was found fainted on the floor. I drove straight here, sir, said the coachman, as the bride's father lifted her out, and I'll swear no one got out of the carriage. We carried her into the house in her bridal dress and drew back her veil. I saw her face. Shall I ever forget it? White, white and drawn with pain and horror. And her hair, her radiant blonde hair, I tell you it was white like snow. As we stood, her father and I, half mad with the horror, a telegraph boy came. He brought an orange envelope to me. I tore it open. Mr. Charrington was thrown from the dog cart on his way to the station at half past one. Killed on the spot. And he was married to May Forster in our small church at half past three. I shall be married, dead or alive. What had passed in that carriage on the homeward drive? No one knows, no one will ever know. Oh, May. Oh, my dear. Before a week was over, May also died. They laid her beside her husband in our little churchyard where they had kept their love promises. Thus John Charrington's wedding was accomplished.